Moi. I would like to start the second part of this video, which is the continuation of the third chapter of the series of documentaries called Suomelle, with uh, the title Michael Agricola, History or Fiction. Again, with a thank you to everybody. The numbers of viewers from literally all over are growing much faster than what I could imagine even uh, in the most optimist provision. And I take the occasion to say to the listener that the purpose of this uh, series is to try to put order in the historical mess presented to us as the only truth. And I hope uh, not to offend anyone with my personal opinion about uh, various topics. As I said uh, at the end of part one, we will touch a subject that for the Finnish people may have a very important uh, meaning, which is the life and achievement of an historical person of great importance in the recent past of the entire country. His name was uh, Mikhail Olawi, more known as uh, Mikhail Agricola. I will not add uh, any personal conclusions about uh, the existence of this person because uh, of the importance that he had in the Finnish history and literature. Having uh, entire days and churches dedicated to him. Talking about uh, the church naming uh, his honor found in Helsinki called Mikhail Agricolan Kirko, the Finnish uh, researcher Unlinked Bird spoke personally in front of me on the phone with the people working in it, trying to fix uh, an appointment to present our studies and talk with some expert about the life of Mikhail Agricola. And with uh, enormous surprise, they told us that the church does not have anything to do with this emblematic person, and they don't even know why the church is calling this way. These are the original words and answer that we had. I'm not making it up. So I will show to the viewers what I could find out uh, about his uh, genealogy. I have chosen a site that present uh, the family tree of uh, literally millions of people. And it is one of the most uh, visited in internet with thousands upon thousands of research uh, daily. To make understand that also in the case of Mikhail Agricola, the picture is uh, at least uh, foggy. For the personal information of uh, Mikhail uh, Agricola, I will use uh, again the main uh, research uh, engine in internet because everywhere I go, this is the first result that we have and people tend to use the easiest way for answers. If we go read his biography, under early life, we learn that his name was uh, Mikhail Olawi or Mikkel Olofsson. He was born in Uzima, in the village of Torsby in Pernaya, Sweden, now Finland around the year 1510. The exact date of his birth, like most detail of his life, is unknown. He had three sisters, but their names are not known. His teachers apparently recognize his aptitude for languages and his rector sent him to Viborg, our day Russia, for Latin school. If we continue reading, under his studies, we can learn that when Mikhail study in Viborg, he assumed the surname Agricola, farmer or agriculture. But it, this translation is uh, incorrect, because the word Agricola is a title added, uh, for example, to a farm or a company, like uh, Azienda Agricola, uh, Azienda mean uh, company. But let's continue his studies. The Viborg castle was ruled by a German count, Johann. In 1536, he was sent to study in Wittenberg, uh, Germany. At this point, uh, I will ask the listener to go study all of his uh, achievement. For example, the translation of the New Testament into Finnish. Because uh, once uh, he has to fit in the historical panorama presented to us, plenty of information are suddenly available. But I will add uh, just uh, one question. 
Under his studies, we can read that once in Germany, he concentrated on the lecture of Philip Melanchthon, who was an expert in Greek, the original language of the New Testament. And in 1537, he started translating the New Testament into Finnish. So how is it possible that in just one year, he could read and translate Greek language, even if his scholastic background was Latin. I mean, I personally speak uh, five languages and I have knowledge and diplomas of at least another two. Unlinked Bird speak three with an enormous understanding of a fourth one. And the Canadian researcher Verbaholic speak almost perfectly four with knowledge even of Arab. So we know a bit what it means learning new languages. Michael Agricola, learning Greek in one year, was a genius. But uh, let's continue. Basically, we don't know anything about the early life of this person. But we don't know much about his death uh, either. And the exact place of his grave, supposedly in Viborg Church, is not known. Only after he goes to Germany, a lot of information appears influencing the history of the country of Finland. What it is also interesting is that on the screen we can see some picture of statues uh, in his honor, in various locations, like in Viborg. But they are all belonging to the 19th and 20th century. So we don't know anything about him, but 400 years later they remember his physiognomy enough to make a statue of him. And also the monument on the chosen place of that is very recent. Actually, I would like to talk a bit about this mysterious lack of old graves. Few months ago, I was uh, living in New England, United States, precisely in the state of Vermont. Beautiful, by the way, with very awesome people living there. To study this mystery of giant bones and uh, skeletons found throughout the area. By the way, I have only found humans with gigantic hearts. And, of course, the first place to start for clues are old cemeteries. Well, with surprise, I have discovered that they either being relocated in recent time, or they simply lack of uh, old graves. I mean, you can find graves belonging to the 19th century, not older, but even that one, they look much younger than actually that period of time, observing the erosion on the stone used. I found it uh, very peculiar. Few weeks later, when I went back to Canada, the New Earth Channel published the work uh, of a guy called uh, Faris Eshaer. At the bottom of this video, I put the link uh, to his research. And I was uh, shocked to discover that the guy was uh, asking the same question to himself. He actually started looking at the West Balkan area of Europe, in particular the country of Croatia, and uh, surprise, the 33 cemetery found in the capital, Zagreb, are all belonging to the 19th century. He could not find any older grave than that period. So while I was studying Finland history, for this series of documentaries, I started investigating the old graves that I could find in this area of the world. And surprise, all of the so-called old cemeteries are from the 20th century. What people they were not dying before, and all of the graves that I saw from the 19th century, they have very recent looking, let's say few decades. But in Finland, they give us another reason for this uh, mystery. As we can read on the screen from the Genealogical Society of Finland official website, cemetery records are not usually used in genealogical research in Finland because there are that record in the church books of most parishes. About 40 cemeteries have been published in the yearbook of the Genealogical Society of Finland. Most of them are from parishes where church records were destroyed. But uh, let's continue reading. Graves are sometimes destroyed by 
perish authorities because of economical reasons. Economical reasons? What could it mean? But here come the best part. Many of the old graves had wooden grave markers which have disappeared because of natural causes. I'm never gonna believe it. This is a lie. I know very well how Finnish people know their land and the weather condition of Finland. And they are very clever at the time of building in consequence of the strong winter condition that the country have to pass through every year. In fact, the old houses have stone blocks under, then the wood house built on top to avoid the contact with the snow. Otherwise the base would be rotten in few decades. So the idea that uh, they would put wood marker on top of the deceased familiar, that uh, after few years they would look rotten, is disconnected to reality and an offense to the knowledge of building of our ancestors. But I will talk uh, in details about this topic in a future episode. For the moment, uh, let's continue with the written language uh, subject. Now I will just add a short uh, overview about the Estonian version of their written language. I will use again uh, the main research uh, engine in Internet. Under history, we can read that the oldest written records of the Finnic language of Estonia date from the 13th century, Originates Livoniae. In Chronicle of Henry of Livonia contains Estonian place names, words and fragments of sentences. And under Estonian literature, we can read that the first extant Estonian book is a bilingual German-Estonian translation of the Lutheran Catechism, dating to 1535. But what is interesting is that the earliest extant sample of connected Estonian are the so-called Kulama prayers, dating from 1524 and 1528. In 1525, the first book published in Estonian language was printed. The book was a Lutheran manuscript, which never reached the reader and was destroyed immediately after publication. So let's make uh, some logical conclusions. The Estonians were starting to write down their language already in the 13th century. By the way, three centuries before the Finnish, uh, which I don't believe. Then they forgot how to write for 300 years and 12 years before the Mikhail Agricola start writing down the Finnish language under the control of German institution to be sure that it's like they want, Estonian published their version of Lutheranism. But something was not fitting properly the historical version that they want, so they destroyed the book and they come out with a bilingual German-Estonian version of the Lutheranism that was more convenient. Do you remember in the first part of this video when I showed you Ludwig von Schlosser personal information and it was written that he laid the foundation for the critical study of the Russian history? Well, again, we have history modified by German historians. But we will come back uh, a third time on this uh, subject later in this video. For the rest, uh, I really would like uh, to know what was written in the destroyed book. And I have to say that uh, there's nothing strange to me about forgetting how to write for a few hundred years because I keep uh, forgetting how to write some words like foggy or fishy but I can open any history book to remind me of the meaning and origin of those words, along with another amazing one, fiction. But as I said in the first part of this video, a good way to understand if a particular person had existed in reality or was part of this hundred of thousand of phantomatic figure needed to fill up those small 1000 years of lies is to follow his uh, genealogy. So let's start with the one of uh, Michael Agricola. Born, we don't know, let's say around uh, 1507. Immediate family, son of Olof Simonsson. So let's go check uh, Olof Simonsson. Birth date, estimated between 1442 and 1502. 
those are only 60 years margin of error. Plus, uh, in the case that he was born in 1502, he was five years old when he became father of Mikhail, and his death, date and location unknown. Hmm, pretty murky. So, let's go back to Mikhail Agricola, husband of uh, Brigitta Olof's daughter. So, his son, uh, Volof, and she is uh, Olof's daughter. It doesn't mean anything, but uh, it is at least uh, bizarre. Let's go check uh, out this uh, Brigitta Olof daughter. Birth date estimated between 1481 and 1541, and her death, date and location unknown. Plus, immediate family, daughter of Olof. And uh, as you can see on the screen, it's not that we can learn much about uh, this Olof. Let's also say that in the scenario of her being born in 1481, she would have married Mikhail Agricola, having almost 30 years more than him. Interesting. But as we can see, Mikhail was not the only love of Brigitta, because she got remarried with Henrik Jakobson. So even if he doesn't have nothing to do with Mikhail Agricola bloodline, let's go check his life. Died in 1588. Husband of Brigitta Olofdotter. Hmm nothing else. So let's go back to Michael Agricola. As we can see here in uh, immediate family, it is written that he was brother of this uh, three phantom named sister, which surname is Olof Dotter, like his wife. And uh, if you go check, the three of them have the same result, nothing. But definitely the road to follow is uh, his son, due to the fact that Michael Agricola became pretty important and known even to the royal Swedish family before his death. So he was no longer an unknown birthday kid, and his son must have been registered and followed in more recent documents. Continuing with the immediate family, in fact, we can read that was father of Christian Agricola, birth date December 11, 1550. And here the situation becomes even more hilarious due to the fact that in the scenario of the mother, Brigitta, being born in 1541, Christian's mother was only nine when she had him. Hmm, interesting. As I said at the beginning of the video, I hope not to offend anyone with my personal comment. But these are very simple equations. So let's continue with uh, Christian Agricola, birthplace Turku, Western Finland, died February 19, 1586, in Tallinn, Estonia. Immediate family, husband of Elin Persdotter Fleming. Let's go investigate a bit uh, her branch. Also, she got uh, remarried with uh, Hans Johansson Stöllarm, who was son of uh, Johan Olofsson Stöllarm and Ragnhild Persdotter Allongren. So, again, son of Olof, I imagine that was an extremely common name at the time, and son of Persdotter, and married a Persdotter. No comment are needed. Also interesting is uh, his birth date, that in case he was born in 1529, the father, Johann Olofsson Stöllarm, that was born without any margin of error in 1524, would have been five years old. Cool. And very interesting is that if we go check the father of Johan, who was Olof Eriksson Stöllarm, he was son again of an Olof daughter, and he was married again with a Fleming. But let's go back to Christian Agricola. We can find out that he was father of only one daughter, Brita Christian Dotter Agricola. So after only one generation, the surname uh, Agricola disappeared from history because her daughter could not pass on the family name. And this scenario is a very common in uh, the various genealogical research that I've done throughout Europe. After one generation, just one or two daughters, so the surname is gone. But it could be only coincidences. So let's go check uh, out this Brita Agricola. 
Again, we can see a very large estimated birth date between 1555 and 1611. Again, we can see two short or long time period between birth date of father and daughter, which uh, would lead to an unrealistic genealogical picture. Christian Ag Agricola, the father, was born without any margin of error in 1550. I let you make the calculation, no comment are needed. Please go check the branch of her husband, because it is fantastic, but I don't have the time in this video to present it. But let's just make it faster and try to get to our goal, which is to find a relative that we can clearly prove his existence with some document in more recent time. Let's concentrate generation after generation, keeping in mind at this point that uh, the surname Agricola has already ended. So Brita Agricola was mother of Karl Svinhufud af Kvalstad. And uh, as we can see, generation after generation, we cannot have a real birth date and everything is estimated in a period of 60 years. Birth date estimated between 50 1580 and 1640. Let's continue with uh, his daughter, Brita Katarina Svinhufud af Kvalstad. Again, no real birth date. And mother of uh, Johan Pendrick and Ebba Pendrick. At this point, uh, the genealogical tree split in, in two. If we follow Johan Pendrick, whose uh, exact birth date, surprise, is unknown, we discover that uh, his father of Marta Beata Pendrick. At this point, Marta's birthday is around the 1700. No other information. And there are no more son or daughter to continue the bloodline. Let's try the other branch of Ebba Pendrick, whose birthday, guess, is unknown. Date and location of that, unknown. Mother of Maria Elizabeth von Ofdal whom again doesn't have any birth date and unknown date and location of that. And at this point, the tree split again in two with uh, Frederick Otto Bilberg and Ulrika Christina Bilberg, whom in both cases, no other descendant can be traced. Now, I'm sure that dedicating a much more extended research on the subject, other information about his genealogy will be discovered. But the main point uh, to me remained that again and again I'm proving myself that in the 15th, 16th or 17th centuries everything is very foggy. I love this word because describe exactly how our supposed history looked to me. Every person that I choose to research for historical purposes have the same result, everything unknown. But let's now change the subject even if uh, the next topic is still related to the origins of the Finnish language. Let's check out what uh, was going on at the same time when Michael Agricola was writing down the Finnish language in neighboring countries. <laughs> 